Hello and welcome to Kyoki Baptist Church online worship service. We're thankful for the chance to connect with you in this way. If you're interested in attending in person or finding out more about us, including some great ways to get involved, please go to kyoki.org. We exist to declare God great, to demonstrate His love, and to be and make disciples of Jesus. The Bow Hunters Festival hits the target on all these and is coming up on May 28th through the 30th. If you'd like to find out more about participating or serving, go to our website, click on our online calendar, and take a look at the event. If you would like to support the ministry of Kyoki, you can do so securely online or by using our mailing address. Hang on to your hard hat and get ready. Vacation Bible School Concrete and Cranes is bulldozing our way and will be here June 7th through the 11th. Registration is open for children who've completed pre-K up to 5th grade. Also, we're in need of a few more volunteers to help out during this fun faith building week. You can register or volunteer at Kyoki.org. In Matthew 28, 19, Jesus says, Go and make disciples of all the nations. This is something we take very seriously as part of our mission here at Kyoki. And in a few minutes, Steve will help us to better understand how to be and grow as disciples. But first, join us as we sing together and worship Christ our Savior. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is more.
Welcome. Thanks for joining us again for the online worship time of Coyote Baptist Church. It's always a privilege to be able to share with you what God not only is doing through the lives of his people, but what he can do and will do. And um, as always, our intention is to make much of the Lord, to declare his greatness. It is to give a display of his goodness by demonstrating his love. And, um, and to make disciples, to come alongside, and if you are a Christian, to, uh, to encourage you in what it means to be a follower, a disciple of Jesus Christ. And if you're not a believer, to open up and to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. If you are a follower of Jesus, uh, then you know the struggle of living kind of in between the tension of living for Christ and living for self, of serving Him or serving your own kind of selfish desires, it can be a lonely struggle. Uh, Van Moore's songs entitled Stranded captures that feeling of, of isolation. He, he begins the song this way, I'm stranded at the edge of the world. It's a world I don't know. Got nowhere to go. Feels like I'm stranded. And I'm stranded between the devil and the deep blue sea. And nobody's going to tell me, tell me what time it is. Well, we are in a series called Disciple. And we are looking at what it means to follow Jesus, to be changed by Jesus, and to be committed to the mission of Jesus. That is the definition of a disciple. Jesus, in Matthew 4, looked at Peter and Andrew and James and John and said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. There's that following part, I will make you. There's the being changed part, fishers of men. That is the mission, the cause of the gospel, the cause of Christ. This is the third of three parts of our vision statement. I mentioned our vision statement, and you can, you can look at it on the screen. It is declaring the greatness of God as He transforms lives by loving and reaching people and making disciples of Jesus. And in 2021, we are desiring as a church to live out the reality of that vision by looking at those three components, declaring, demonstrating, and discipling. We declare God, we demonstrate His love to others, and we make disciples who follow Him, who are being changed by Him, and are committed or surrendered to His cause. Today, we are going to do an overview, and in doing so, address the question of why Christ-likeness is so elusive for believers. Um, we've been looking in, in ti- entitling our messages in this series we're calling Disciple uh, from songs that I choose that, that I grew up with and, and have stuck with me. Song- quoted Van Morrison Stranded, and I shared last week that he's one of my favorite artists. And the last line that I quoted in that song says, Nobody's going to tell me what time it is. Well, our song today is from a group known as Chicago, and it is from their first album, and it became one of Chicago's greatest hits. And the title is, Does Anybody Really Know What Time It Is? And the reason I chose this song is not because I'm preaching on the return of Christ and you better be aware, better beware of the signs. And it's not primarily because it's a cool song that asks a pretty important question, although indeed it is. But rather, I chose it 
because of the, of the reason the composer of the song, Robert Lamb, wrote it. And I'm going to share more of that with you a little bit later on in the message. So, no pausing me up why he wrote the song okay just wait until you hear and then you can look it up and research it all you want so we are going to be in the book of first corinthians today and we're going to land first corinthians chapter three but if you would uh so go ahead and open up to first corinthians chapter three because i want us to go just start and read uh the first nine verses of that that chapter so here we go you ready 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not yet ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, you are not, are you not of the flesh? And behaving only in a human way. For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. I want us to look today at three keys to understanding discipleship. And we are going to pick, as I mentioned earlier, we are going to pick a part of our vision statement. So let's begin with the backstory, which is this, the demonstration of God's love to sinners. The backstory is the demonstration of God's love to sinners. Now normally when we refer to demonstrate, we are talking about our responsibility to demonstrate the love of Christ to unbelievers and to each other. But it's really important that we know the backstory of how we get to that point of being able to demonstrate the love of Christ to, believe, to unbelievers and to one another. And that is because of Christ's love that has been poured out and demonstrated to us. Even while we were still sinners, Paul writes about that in the fifth chapter of Romans. So, Paul here deals with spiritual immaturity. And I think it's really important that we look at what happens in salvation that puts us to the point where we can ask Christ. Because until you're in Christ, you can't grow in Christ. So, let's look at what happens at salvation. When you come to Jesus trusting Him in faith, trusting Him alone, you are in that moment saved from the penalty of sin. We confess that we're sinners who sin. And that in Christ, the sinless Savior who bore our sins on the cross, we find in Him our only hope. And when we trust Him as our Redeemer, our Savior, our Lord, our King, we are saved from the penalty of sin. Now watch this. One day, when the Lord calls us home to Himself, we will be saved from the presence of sin. Sin. 
There will be no pain. There will be no protest. There will be no anger. There will be no temptation, no regrets, no failure, no tears, no death. How amazing heaven will be. But that is yet to come for those who remain in this present life on the earth. It hasn't happened yet. For our loved ones who died in Christ, they are there. They are with the Lord. But for us today, we're still here. In Christ, in this life, we are saved in Jesus from the penalty of sin. But then... In heaven, with him, we will be saved from the presence of sin. Note the difference. Now we're saved from sin's penalty. Then we will be saved from sin's presence. It won't even be around. It won't exist. Now it exists. But in Christ, we don't pay the penalty. Then it doesn't even exist. So... While we're in this life, what does God do to enable us to deal with the fact that sin remains, even though sin's penalty has been paid for? Well, what he does is he gives us his spirit. The Bible calls the Holy Spirit to indwell us in order to save us from the presence of the power of sin. Now track with me. Track with me. Alistair Begg puts it this way. He says, we live in between two turning points. The turning point of regeneration, where we come to faith in Christ. And the second is the turning point of glorification, where we are welcomed into the presence of Christ. In between the, those two turning points, we are in process. We are in the process that the Bible calls sanctification. If you were to look at our definition of a disciple, it is the process where we are being changed by Jesus through the Holy Spirit. The technical term of that is sanctification. It is the process of a Christian, i.e. a disciple, maturing, growing up into being more and more like Jesus. Now, if you've got your Bible still with you, turn back in 1 Corinthians to chapter 1 to the second verse of the whole letter. Paul has introduced himself, and in verse 2, notice what he said. He's writing the letter to the church of God that is in Corinth. Now, that's a specific location, the body of believers in the city of Corinth. Now, now get this, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those in every place, with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Now that's, a, that's an impactful one verse, right? I mean, the church, the body of Christ is made up of those who call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who have been uh, absolved, redeemed from the penalty of sin. But... At that moment when I call upon the name of Christ, I am being sanctified in Christ Jesus, and I am called to be a saint together with all the other saints. Now here's the fascinating thing about sanctified and saint. The root word is the same. It means holy. In other words, I'm being sanctified, I am in the process of being made holy. I'm being made holy like Christ, into the image of Christ. My established position in Christ is that of a holy one, so that I'm a saint, 
so that even though it's the same root word, it is used in a little bit different way in each instance. One, sanctified, is the process. Second, saint is who I am. It is my position in Christ. Now, why in the world am I belaboring this? Here's why it's important. The fact that we have been saved from the penalty of sin does not mean that our struggle with sin is over. Just because I become a saint, just because I call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, it means that process of holiness, of Christ-like, is begun in me at the instant that I call upon his name, that I believe in faith, he fills me, he puts and dwells me with, the, with his Holy Spirit, and the process of sanctification begins. But it, in that process, I'm dealing, I'm struggling with sin that remains in me. In fact, the struggle for a believer takes a new form once they are in Christ. While we have died to sin, sin has not died in us. And any honest human being that's in Jesus will confess that. Now I say that because some people refuse that. Some people believe that they are without sin. The Apostle John wrote about that in, in his first letter, and he calls people that deny that they sin, that they have sin in them, he calls them liars. Sin no longer reigns in us. It doesn't control us. We've died to sin, but it does remain in us. And it's because sin remains in us that problems can arise for us. We're in Christ positionally. We're saints. The Holy Spirit lives in us. He is conforming us to the image of Jesus. That's part of being his disciple. But sin remains, and the struggle remains. And that's why in the church, as the body of Christ, we have spiritual babies, spiritual infants, be spiritual adults. So the New Testament makes clear that there is a struggle, there is a conflict that every Christian deals with. And it identifies those three areas of our struggle as the world, the flesh, and the devil. Uh, In Ephesians chapter 2, the first few verses, Paul confronts that struggle as he writes to the believers in the church in Ephesus. So in Ephesians 2, verse 1, he says, You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. You got that? That's our pre-Christ state. We were dead. Spiritually, we were dead. We walked in those trespasses and sins. Now notice this. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So, just identify. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. Then in verse 2, those, that is how we walked. How? Following the course of this world. The world that we live in. Second part of verse 2, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at at work in the sons of disobedience. And then in verse 3, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. So, the fact is, we still face conflict on those three fronts. We do not have to submit to that. We have the power, because of the Spirit's presence, to combat that. But if you, if you don't recognize the fact that 
conflict is real in these areas of the devil, the flesh, and the world, then it can, it can cause issues and it can, call, and it can cause danger for the people of God. We live in a world that is, uh, that is going in an extremely self-centered yet attractive direction. It might seem like it is exacerbated in our day, but it is nothing new. Since the fall in the Garden of Eden, the world has been going in an anti-God direction. With its tentacles pulled out, uh, reached out in order to pull in the people of God. And it looks so enticing. And there is every allure that would cause us to say, I want what the world has to offer. And there is an enemy, Satan, who offers relationships, financial success, pleasures that will be, uh, that will be all yours, the enemy offers, if you will simply step over a few boundaries. Ignore this, ignore that. Don't be so serious about following God's Word. Don't be such a Christian square. Fudge a little bit on the numbers at work. Who's going to know if you begin to flirt and be enticed by that other person? Come on. Well, a disciple sits in the midst of this conflict. Think about it. When you got married, you took vows and you answered questions uh, in those vows regarding commitment uh, of that other person that you were marrying, protection of that person, love that you were feeling for that person, fidelity and faithfulness unto that person. And the proof of those vows that you made to that person, to your spouse, and to God has been played out in your marriage ever since. The depth of those vows, of those commitments, or the lack of attention to those vows. It's there. You know it. God knows it. Well, in the same manner, your walk with Christ, the surrender to the Lordship of Jesus, when you in faith claimed Him as your Savior, your Master, your Lord, has been played out ever since. And it is seen in your life. Okay? So, that's the backstory. That's the backstory. The demonstration of what it means to be His. The demonstration of the love of God to you in Christ and your response to that love. So the second key to understanding discipleship um, is the dealing with the issue. And the issue is the disciples' growth. The disciples' growth. Now, we finally made it back to 1 Corinthians 3. Um, I'll make it back if I can get the right Corinthians. I was in second. So, the issue is recognized by Paul at the end of verse 2 when he says, even now you're not yet ready. What's that talking about? Well, look at verse 1. He says, But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. Now, what's he talking about? To understand what he's talking about, you have to go back to verse 1 of chapter 2 because it's part of a broader, a longer discussion. And in verse 1 of chapter 2, he says, I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. Point is, he's talking about when he first came to them. 
And he's saying in verse 1 of chapter 3, listen, when I came to you, I didn't address you as spiritual giants, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. Why? Because many of them, most of them, were infants in Christ. They had just come to know the Lord. It's, he's not chastising them in verse 1 or even in the first part of verse 2 when he says, I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Everything's okay. When I, when, when I came to you, Corinthians, you were spiritual babies. So I gave you what babies need. I gave you milk. He is not condemning them here. You don't give a baby what a baby can't digest or take in. A baby needs milk. If you've got an infant, you don't go through the drive through at Zaxby's and order them a wings and things. You may want the wings and things, but that baby needs milk. And so that's what you give them. So Paul, in the first verse and a half, He's, he's just reminding them of, of how he taught them, how he ministered to them when they were new Christians. The problem comes in that second part of verse 2. Even now, you are not yet ready. He's, he's, he's saying, why are some of you still in diapers? Why are, why are some of you still spiritual infants? I mean, let, let's face it. Babies in a crib, physical babies in a crib, are sweet, right? Adults in a crib is strange. A baby cooing one moment and oblivious to everything but their own needs, that's normal. But an adult cooing and oblivious to everything but their own needs, that's downright creepy. It's not that the Corinthian believers here hadn't heard the right things. It's not that like, they were intellectual pygmies. It's not that they didn't have the right foundation of teaching. Paul had taught them, and, and, and as we read earlier, Apollos had preached to them. Their problem was not they weren't smart enough, and their problem was not that they didn't have the truth. Their problem was spiritual. It was a spiritual issue. The reason a person remains a spiritual infant is not because they lack a grasp on intellectual things. It is the result of not paying attention to spiritual things. Let's, uh, let's look. I know we've been looking at a few different passages, and I want to one more time. As mentioned in chapter 1, this is not the first time in, in this letter that Paul references division of the church. They're saying, I'm a follower of a read that some are saying, well, I'm a, I'm a follower of Cephas, who was, who was Simon Peter. Well, Peter, in his first letter, uh, in his second chapter, I, I want us just to read the opening verses of 1 Peter 2. This is what he writes. So put away all malice and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Now, by the way, just so you know, Peter is writing this letter to many churches, right? I mean, he, he begins the letter by making a list of who all, where all the churches that he's writing to are located. It's a big number, large number. Now, verse 2, like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. And this is the scary part. Look at verse 3. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Now here's what's going on. 
Peter's addressing these Christians from these different churches, and they are evidently acting with malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. And he calls it as it is. He says, you're acting like babies. You're acting like babies. Grow up. Drink the pure spiritual milk so that you can begin to grow. And then, verse 3, if indeed you are a Christian, if indeed you are the Lord's disciple, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good, i.e., you're not living like it. You're claiming to be a disciple of Jesus, but you're not living like it. You have been released from the penalty of sin don't abide in sin. Don't remain in your sin. And there's just some everyday examples that we need to confront here. Just because you might come and listen to the Word being preached doesn't mean that you are a man or a woman of the Word. The truth is, if you think that listening to a sermon or going to a Sunday school class or being involved in a ministry is enough to make you a mature disciple, you are sorely mistaken. Because you go to church, because you even study your Bible, if you are living for yourself and you are seeking the pleasures of the world instead of the treasures of God, You are one of two things. You are a spiritual infant, or you are lost. You are deceived in your salvation. The fact is, it's really significant that you listen to good teaching, and you come to worship God, and you don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. But if you're not feeding yourself daily, I mean, the assembling of yourself in the act of worship of God and listening to preaching and teaching if you're in a Bible study, that happens one to two times a week. But if you are not day by day by day feeding yourself upon the Word of God, spending time with the Father in prayer, coming before Him, then your life's probably not being changed. And if your life's not being changed by what you read and digest, as well as the Holy Spirit, if your relationships aren't changed, if they're not different today than they were six months ago, six years ago, then Christ is not being formed in you. And you are either a spiritual baby or you're not a spiritual man or woman at all. So, the definition of the issue is that there are worldly people, there are spiritual infants. That's what was going on in Corinth. That's what was going on in the churches that Peter addresses. Instead of the Spirit of God controlling these people, the Spirit of the flesh has its tentacles in them. And they are seeking the desires of the flesh instead of the desires of the Spirit. The proof of spiritual immaturity is this. It is acting and living in an immature way, like a child. Like a child. I mean, we've all been around children who are consumed with getting their own way. You've got to play their games with their toys until they decide one moment that they want to play with your toys. They have to get their way. And if you won't play their way, they'll take their toys and they'll go home. The problem with all of this is when that child grows up, and is acting the same way, but is now in a church, thinking, living, acting like a seven-year-old. That's what's going on in Corinth. Spiritual maturity is not automatic. It doesn't, it doesn't come with the passage of time. Just because I've been a Christian 30 years doesn't mean I'm a spiritually mature 30-year-older in Christ. 
but it comes by submission to the Spirit of God and the daily disciplined practice of the Word of God. And candidly, the reason so many churches struggle is that they have spiritual babies, spiritual infants, in places of decision-making. And when that happens, clicks are in and community is out. Competitiveness is in. Compassion is out. Jealousy is in. Harmony is out. Selfishness is in. And serving is out. Manipulation is in. And the message of the gospel is out. The personality of self is placed on the throne and Christ himself is dethroned. And in all of this, there's a problem. There's a problem. So what's the answer to the problem? What's the fix? Well, that's the third key to understanding discipleship. And that is dealing with the solution. The fix is the declaring of the right person. The declaring of the right person person it has been said that division in the church is all, all the division in the church always stems from a wrong preoccupation initially when i'm preoccupied with myself as a new believer but as i grow in christ that preoccupation with self begins to change into a preoccupation with the Lord Jesus. And how does that take place? How does that happen? It is through trusting of the Word of God and in the power of the Spirit of God, my focus begins to change. Whatever any of us is an able to do in the church is an undeserved gift from God. Whatever takes place, whatever transpires for the good of the people of God is a gift from God himself. Whatever it is, regardless of what it is, whatever any single person is enabled to do in the body is a gift from the hand of God. As a result, our response should be to fall on our knees and thank the Lord, not stand up and beat our chest to draw attention to ourselves. The focus changes. The fix is, I no longer am declaring me, but I am declaring Christ. He is not my disciple. I am his disciple. I am not his master. He is my master. Jesus is Lord. And the way this plays out in the body of Christ in the church is that we recognize that individual believers who have been given gifts those gifts are just that. They are gifts. They are given to us. I mean, when, when Paul writes in verse 5, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, get this, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered. Who cares? It's God that gave the growth. The who cares, I added. That's Paul's point. God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything. When's the last time you looked at the work, the efforts of your hands to the body as nothing? Well, when, when God gets the glory, when it is God that is being declared great and not self, that's what takes place. That's what happens. Only God gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. Listen, 
your, your rewards in heaven are not based on what somebody else does. Your rewards from the Lord in heaven will be based on what you've done. For we are, verse 9, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. You belong to Him. That is the fix. It is the declaration. It is the focus. It is the spotlight being on the right person. We declare God. And when we begin to focus on the, on the, on the ones that have been given the gifts, or when we begin to focus on the gift itself, rather than the giver of the gifts, all kind of horrors arise in the body of Christ within the church. Paul and Apollos were servants of God. They were not God. I mentioned to you that we're calling this message, does anybody really know what time it is? And I told you that I would share why I selected this song it is a great song it is uh it is a it is a long time favorite of mine but the reason ultimately why i chose it was because robert lamb who who was the composer of both the lyrics and the music itself has shared that when he wrote the song he knew that the lyrics were kind of to quote him quirky but he wrote the song to give the horn section of the group a chance to show off. And particularly, his trumpet player, Lee Langan. Well, he did a good job, because if you know that song, the horns show off, and especially the trumpet shows off throughout the song. Several years ago, I, I was able to see Chicago in concert, and uh, at the end of the concert, when the band left the stage, there were a few songs that they had not sung, some of their main hits, including, does anybody really know what time it is? And so the, the, the crowd is 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 standing there waiting applauding for an encore well we did get an encore and we did get to hear during as part of the encore does anybody really know what time it is but imagine if when the group came back on stage the horn section stayed behind and instead of the actual horn players the security guards came out on the platform who knew nothing of any instruments, much less how to play them. And they pick up the horns and they sound horrible. Well, we weren't there to hear security guards play the horns. We were there to hear the horn players. We were there to hear... Lee Longman play that trumpet, that solo that starts the beginning of the song. Here's the point. The body of Christ, the church, is not about the pastor. It's not about the lay leadership. It's not about the staff. It's not about the band or the instrumentalists. It's not about the congregation. We do not declare our greatness. It's not about you. It's not about me. We declare the greatness of God. That's what marks the life of a disciple. And when we as church begin to declare ourselves or any particular individual, we are lying, we are deceiving, we are cheating people from seeing the one who matters, the one who can save them from the mess that is their life, just like he saved us from the mess that is our life. So, 
when somebody stands on the platform in, during a worship service of the church and sings a beautiful God-exalting song accompanied by tremendous instruments and in unison they take our hearts, our souls, our minds to heaven's door. We don't worship the singer. We don't worship the instrument. We worship the one who has gifted them, who has made them to praise God. Now, I will grant you that in the economy, in the body of Christ, some are more visible, some are more vocal. But the gift, the reward, is to the one who serves. To the one that is a disciple of Jesus, that is following his or her Lord, that is being changed by the Lord, and that is committed to the mission of the Lord. Not in self-exaltation, but in humility. I think of our own church, and there are so many people that behind the scenes, humbly, graciously, without any fanfare, serve Christ. I'm thinking of a couple in our church, Bobby and Becky Burnley, who before COVID hit, week after week, nobody knew. They never announced they were in the building or when they had left the building. They just very humbly came and they would pew by pew check and make sure that there were pencils and there were pens and there were welcome cards and there were prayer cards and the hymnals and the Bibles were set just right. And it would take them quite a long time. They would come and they would go. And nobody knew. Oh, you would arrive on Sunday and you would see and the pens would be there and the cards would be in their place and the hymnals would be fixed just right. But you didn't know who did it. You didn't know who did it. You will not read about Bobby and Becky Burnley in Christianity Today or in the newest, grooviest Christian blog, their names won't be found. But I tell you where they will be found, in the Lamb's Book of Life. And when, when the Lord Himself distributes gifts and rewards to His people, that's where they'll be found. That is what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Not seeking self-glory, but just as time goes, being changed and maturing in Christ. It's becoming a spiritual adult and not remaining a spiritual baby. Somewhere in there, you'll find yourself. Oh, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you. Not to, not to seek to be known, not to seek to be praised and exalted but just in the humility of the quietness of being a disciple of jesus declaring his greatness practicing the discipline of the word doing those things that in his word he says this is what matters pursue this pursue holiness Oh, that we will. Let's pray. Father, it's easy to scream and to make much of self. And it's not so easy to, in simple humility, point the focus to Jesus. But may that be exactly what happens. And Lord, I realize that there are, there are probably people that are watching this that have never come to the realization that Jesus died on a cross to forgive them of all sin. That the sinless Savior died for sinners 
And then, God, for those people that are watching, I pray, Lord, that in the quietness of their room, maybe right where they're at, or maybe later today, they will bow their heart and surrender their lives to the reign and the salvation that Christ alone provides. And Lord, for those that are watching that are disciples, but as, Lord, as they do a, 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 an inspection, an examination of where you fit in their lives, Lord, there may need to be some repentance and there may need to be some humble acceptance and acknowledgement that you are not where you should be. And may that change. May that change starting today. We love you. And God, we know that you care about us and you care about these things in our lives. So be the one that changes and conforms us to the image of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. We are going to once again end our, our time together through the worship of the Lord Jesus Christ in song. Have a great week. I look forward to being with you next time. You're the voice of love that's calling. There's a chair that waits for you. And a friend who Understands everything you're going through. But you keep standing at a distance. Savior